Yeah, good evening, everybody. Welcome again to the people who are here this afternoon, and welcome again for the people who are who are here uh, this Tuesday, and welcome to the people who are here uh, for the first time. Um, my name is Mitchell Isaias, and on behalf of New Urban Collective, I'll give a short introduction to the the team of tonight. But I'm not alone to do the introduction. I'm here with uh, Wendelin, who is also here. <laughs> It's a very strange position. Now I'm starting to feel it really strongly. So I'm doing a welcome on behalf of my hostness and my guestness. <laughs> I'm honored to be a guest of um, Mitchell's and uh, Black Archives program. I'm really super excited to be here in the, the company of tonight and what's going to happen. It's much more with you than with me, but I just wanted to say hi. I'm Wendelin van Oldenborg, the artist of Cinema Hollanda, which is a project that's mainly in the pavilion, or not mainly, it starts in the pavilion of the Venice Biennial in Venice, but has a parallel program in the Netherlands that was highly needed, it seems, and it seems to be drawing a lot of audience. And all I can say is that, again, I'm a guest at that program, so I'm going to sit down and leave it to you. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you. It feels a bit weird because it's our third event this week, so <laughs> I feel like I'm repeating myself. But I do see a few new faces, so I will give a short introduction for uh, those who are new. And for the people who have been here two times already, you'll just have to, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll do it in English for the first time, so maybe you will pick up something new. Um, but tonight's event is around the tradition of black radicalism with uh, Dr. Kehinde Andrews. Um, and as Wendelin said, we are here. Uh, because of a collaboration with Wendelin and Lucy and uh, Witte de Witt, which um, yeah, was started because Wendelin was making a yeah, film uh, in which she used some material from our archive. Uh, she used some material about Otto Hazard. Yeah, some people may ask, eh, who is Otto Hazard? The people who have been ho here already this morning or this afternoon already know the story. But for those who are new, I'll give a very short introduction. Um, <clears throat> one other important announcement is that, no, I'll do that in the end. <laughs> so the archives, uh, we started a few years ago as a student organization, NUC, New Urban Collective in Amsterdam. And um, yeah, from the beginning, we've been organizing all kinds of events around the history of colonialism, race, slavery, and its legacy, of course in the form of institutional racism, uh, in education, on the labor market, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we've been organizing all kinds of events and projects such as a mentoring program in which we coach and mentor the children in Amsterdam Southeast, um, decolonizing the university because yeah, we still see the, the, that there's a lack of diversity and a lack of uh, you know, attention um, around the issues that we will discuss tonight in the curricula. And two years ago, we were approached by two members of our uh, network, Miguel and Chemo Halbron, because their father was a sociologist at the University of Amsterdam, uh, but unfortunately he passed away. But he left behind a lot of books, approximately four to 5,000 books. Um, and they ended up sending half of those books to Suriname, to the Anton de Combe University, and the rest they wanted to make available in the Netherlands. So they you know, sent an email to a lot of people and we responded. Um, and we ended up setting up uh, yeah, a small grassroots library called the New Urban Cafe in the north of Amsterdam, where we made those uh, you know, books available for people who were interested in them, organized small-scale events, such as dinner discussions, etc. Um, however, within a few months, we had to uh, vacate the building because of gentrification and some other developments. Um, <clears throat> and quite co coincidentally, we came across the Vereniging on Suriname, eh? uh, the Association of Surinamese People, which is the oldest migrant self-organization in the Netherlands. Um, and we heard that they also had some books and some archives but we, you know, we didn't really know what. 
who came there, made the appointment, and uh, I remember quite well, January, February of last year, we came in that space, opened the door, and uh, I was uh, kind of <laughs> blown away because of the, the chaos. It was one big mess, one big chaos, boxes everywhere, very dusty. Um, but we ended up making a deal with them, saying that, you know, if we help them organize the chaos and we could put our books there, then it would be a win-win situation. So we started unpacking the boxes and ended up finding a lot of interesting material in those boxes. Um, here are a few pictures of what it looked like after a few months. Yeah, the, old, the old boxes, the old shelves, etc. We've been working with volunteers every Saturday. And this is what it looks like now. So, you know, we made some progress. <laughs> However, what's interesting are um, yeah, the stories that we, found, that, that we found in the boxes. A lot of hidden histories, a lot of stories that we, or at least I, and I know a lot of people, both young and old, never heard about. Um, I'll share one example because it ties into the theme of tonight. One example is the story of... Uh, this guy right here, his name is Otto Haswald, and sorry I didn't get, get to translate the sheet, but I'll give a short summary. Who, the people who have not been here, you don't have to, uh, you know, play the game. Who, um, who already heard about Otto, or who, who has never heard about Otto Haswald? Please raise your hand. Uh, so quite a few people. Okay, that's good. Um, <clears throat> so, I never heard about him as well, two years ago. But we found some of his personal documents and, 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 and books and his wife's personal documents and archival materials in, um, at On Suriname. And we started doing research because <clears throat> one of the things that we found, you can see in the exhibition, is a book signed by Langston Hughes, eh, one of the well-known poets from the Harlem Renaissance. And we found out that you know, he had a very interesting story Born in 1893, uh, at the age of 16, he hopped on a boat, ended up in New York. Uh, he became a, uh, the only co-founder of the Communist Party of the United States. Um, traveled a lot, uh, became part of the Comintern, Intern, yeah, the International Communist Network, and met with Lenin in Moscow, uh, debated Marcus Garvey in Jamaica, um, met with W.E.B. Dubois, so all of a sudden we saw a link between our, you know, history in Amsterdam and Suriname and the, you know, history of the early civil rights movement of African American history of black history, a history which, you know, I think a lot of people are much more familiar with. So <clears throat> what's interesting is that he traveled to Suriname in, during the Second World War and he was uh, jailed as an enemy of the state. But after the Second World War, he ended up in Amsterdam and he became the chair of On Suriname. And we found a lot of documents which showed how, you know, the organization got politicized, got more radical, started to fight for independence, um, and maintained a very expansive uh, international network. Uh, you know, became part of those international movements against colonialism, against racism, uh, and against imperialism. So it's an amazing story, in my opinion, and the opinion of New Urban Collective. And so one of our missions is to, you know, do more research on this history. Uh, this afternoon we had a session about a later part of history about the Lausanne. Uh, I see a few people who are active in the Lausanne here. Welcome again. Um, but the archive shows that there's a lot of hidden history, maybe e even erased history of, you know, black resistance, black history, uh, which has been lying right under our nose, but a lot of us just didn't know about it. So, <clears throat> what we want to do tonight is, or at least we invited Dr. Kehinde Andrews all the way from Birmingham City, uh, university in the UK to yeah, share some information about the context in which you know a lot of these black radical uh, 
thinkers, organizers, and movements were operating. Um, we asked him to share some information about, you know, what does it mean to be a black radical? What is black, radi black radicalism? Even what is blackness? Because often we use, you know, certain terms, concepts, or theories, or histories, but don't really think about, you know, what it actually means to be a black radical. Um, so, with that being said, I'm going back to the beginning to say that <clears throat> one of our missions with the archives is to uncover the erased, the hidden, the forgotten history of black resistance in the Netherlands. But as you notice, it's quite a lot of work. We've got more than 5,000 books, and we had a donation of more than 5,000 books again. Uh, just 10% of it can be seen in the exhibition here. But to make this history more available, to make it more accessible for the public, we aim to you know, develop an exhibition and to digitalize a part of the, of the archive. And to do that, we need as much help as we can use. This is why we started, uh, we aim to start a crowdfunding campaign on July 1st, Kedi Kodi, uh, Embellishment of Slavery. Uh, but to be able to start with the crowdfunding, we need to uh, get 200 votes. This afternoon, the last time I checked, we had about 170. 184. 184. Okay. Who didn't vote yet? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, if you promise me at the end of the program that you're going to vote via apura.org, we got the 200 <laughs> votes, and then you can uh, we can start with the crowdfunding campaign on July 1st. So, with that being said, Please give a warm round of applause for Dr. Andrews, and then I'll uh, give the stage to him. Hello. hello. How do you say hello in Dutch? I learned literally no Dutch. Hello, is that it? Ah, well, there you go. Easy, 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 easy. All right, let me just. Um, all right, is that okay? Can you? Can you hear me? Leading me closer. And you're gonna fix it, all right? All right. All right. So, thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Uh, it's great to be in a different country as well. And actually, hearing that. I think the quote that I just tweeted out from Mitchell is really important. Trying to uncover the erased, the lost, and then the forgotten histories of black resistance. And black resistance hasn't just happened in America, it hasn't just happened in the UK, it hasn't just happened on the African continent or in the Caribbean, it really has happened in Europe. Actually, Europe has been a really central place for the black resistance struggle in many, 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 many ways. So that's kind of where I wanna, I wanna start with this because I'm currently writing a book about black radicalism. So answering those questions. What is black radicalism? Why is black radicalism useful? What isn't black radicalism as well? Because I would actually argue that we have a very, very bad understanding of what black radicalism is, all right? Actually, probably most of the things you think it is, it probably isn't really any of those things. So over the next 40 minutes or so, um, I'm gonna kind of give you a brief overview and then feel free Pepper me with questions, etc. But the place I wanted to start was with Malcolm X. Anybody know what country, what was the, before Malcolm died, he died in 1965 in New York. Nine days before that, he'd actually given his last speech outside of the United States. Anybody know where that speech was? Nope, was it, was it, it wasn't in Canada. It was it? Oh, is it? Oh, is it? Yeah. No way! I told you something. Thing. Yeah. Right there. It's right there. Ah, cheating. Yes, it's Birmingham. It's in Birmingham. He's actually in Birmingham. The last speech he gives outside of <laughs> right up <up> there <laughs> was um, in Birmingham. Nine days before he died, he gave a speech 
at the Grand Hotel in Birmingham. Actually, the story of Birmingham is interesting because he was never supposed to come to Birmingham on this trip. So on this trip, he had gone to London and he met people in London, uh, the African Students Association, and he was supposed to be going to France, flew to France, but France had decided he was no longer allowed in the country. So they didn't let him in. They said, you can't come to France, we're gonna get, you gotta leave. And he actually went back to the UK and it was the Indian Workers Association who took advantage of this and brought him to Birmingham. I said, well, come to Birmingham, give a few talks. At the time, Birmingham was interesting. Smethwick, a place in Birmingham, had just had an election. We, there was a TV show called The Most Racist Election in British History. In this election, and I, I kid you not, the conservative uh, right-wing party actually won the vote and one of their informal slogans, which they painted all across the walls in Smethwick, was, if you want a nigger for a neighbor, vote Labour. All right, this is how, I mean, it was just an openly racist campaign. And they won, right? We had the KKK who were actually in Birmingham at this point. They were burning um, crosses on people's doors. Uh, the local council was stopping people uh, from, who were migrants from renting houses and things like this. So it was a really terrible place. And so Malcolm comes to, to Smedic and basically says, this situation is exactly the same as the situation in America. And actually he's looking like it could be the same as the situation in Germany just 20 years previously, right? And that's the context that Malcolm comes to Birmingham. When he's in Birmingham, he also talks at the University of Birmingham, also talks at um, this hotel, the Grand Hotel. And then nine days later, he's back in New York and he's assassinated. And why is that story important? It's important because it starts to tell us a picture about the influence and the politics of black radicalism outside of America. In fact, interestingly, Malcolm is often seen to be an American. But what does that even mean to be an American? Malcolm's uh, grandmother was from the Caribbean. Malcolm's biggest influence. Anybody know? I guess do a, we'll do a few questions. Anybody know? Who do you think was the biggest influence on Malcolm X's philosophy? Who do you think? Biggest influence on Malcolm X's philosophy? It's Marcus Garvey. I mean, Mar Malcolm's Malcolm's philosophy is basically, in principle, Garveyism. Marcus Garvey, born in Jamaica, biggest influence on, and actually Marcus Garvey is not just the biggest influence on Malcolm, Marcus Garvey is a, one of the biggest influences of the 20, 20th century full stop, and particularly of the black radical tradition of the 20th century. So even though Marcus Garvey never goes to the continent of Africa, because he's banned from going, uh, the red, black, and the green that you see on the flags of Kenya, if you see on the flags of Mozambique, if you see on the flags of lots of countries, in the, in the, the Black Star in Ghana, all of this comes from Marcus Garvey. Garvey's work was basically read during the Kenyan Revolution. Garvey's work it was read from village to village. They went around translating it and reading it out to people. The Negro World became one of the biggest publications um, in history, full stop, actually. The Universal Negro Improvement Association, which Garvey started, had five million members at its peak in the 20s across 50 countries. It's the single biggest black organization that has ever existed. It's one of the biggest civil organizations that has ever existed full stop, right? So Garveyism, hugely important to a lot of, and underlies a lot of what we think of as American black politics. Garvey is massively important. Garvey, and not just Garvey himself, but Garveyism more generally. Amy Jakes Garvey, Amy Ashwood Garvey, his two wives, um, really important as well to Garveyism. So when we talk about America, we talk about blackness, even the stuff that happened in America isn't necessarily American, right? It's much broader than that. And actually, Otto Hauswood would be a very important example of that as well. People like Claudia Jones. Have you heard of Claudia Jones? Claudia Jones was really influential black female Marxist from Trinidad. He was really influential in the American Communist Party and actually dies in London. She's actually buried to the left of Karl Marx in London. Symbolically very important as well, right? Um, so you think people like Claudia Jones, people like Garvey, Garvey also died in Europe, died in London, um, Otto Haswood. But one of the things we need to do for a radical analysis is to do away with the idea of the nation state. What does Europe mean? What, does, what do these boundaries between Jamaica and the UK mean? Actually, when I, when I ask, well, typically in the UK, I won't ask you here, but in the UK, I usually ask people, who do you think is the most influential black British person of all time? And some of, the, some of the names people give me are quite um, perplexing. Mo Farah, you know Mo Farah, the runner, comes up a lot. 
um, from her. But actually, for me, the most influential black British person of all time is Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey was born a subject of the British Empire on the island of Jamaica. Marcus Garvey died in London in 1940. And when he was in Jamaica and when he was in London, he was actually in the same country. Jamaica is a construction, a complete and utter creation of, of Britain, of not Britain, but of the West. Right? It has no existence other than that. Even It's unlike somewhere like India, where you could say, the British went into India, took over India, and then they left. Do you know what, what the native population of, the, of any country in the Caribbean, Suriname, in, in, South Africa, in South America as well, the native population is not African, they're not black. The native population were basically exterminated by Western powers. So the Jamaican nation, nation state is a creation of the West, completely. Wouldn't, look, wouldn't exist, wouldn't exist, look like that at all. So Garvey's born in Britain, Garvey dies in Britain. When Garvey dies, there actually is no such thing as Jamaica. Jamaica only gets independence in 1962. Marcus Garvey dies in 1940. The reason that, the reason that Garvey ends up in London is because he is deported from America. They don't want to send him to Jamaica because they're, they're worried about the unrest that he'd caused in Jamaica. So they deport him to the place that was on his passport, which was that he's a subject of the British crown. So actually, when we start to think about Europe, we have to stop thinking about Europe as just being these countries that, in this little part of the world. Europe's influence has been, and not just influence, but Europe's national formation is based on empire. These, aren't, these weren't countries, these were empires. Britain stretched for two thirds of the world. Holland stretched to different parts of those places, and those places were part of Holland. And when you start to actually understand that Europe used to exist, literally Europe covered most of the world. That was Europe. Then we have a completely different understanding of the influence of one black radicalism, but also two that starts to influence how we understand things like migration in itself. Right? When my parents came to Jamaica, came to the UK, they did never, they never left the British state. Never left the they were always in Britain. They were in Britain when they started, and they were in Britain when they finished. That makes a completely different discussion of migration when we look at that. And also, this is important because when you have that circulation across the globe, usually in relation to colonialism, that obviously changes how we understand the politics. So there can't be an American politics of black radicalism. There can't be a British politics of black radicalism. There can't be a Jamaican politics of black radicalism. It makes no sense. Black radicalism is a global politics which has affected, which has affected and changed and moved across all those different spaces. It makes no sense to try and separate those bits out. Right? It's impossible. Does that make sense with me, with me so far? All right, so that's the kind of the context I want to put um, black radicalism in Europe, right? Because underlying the black radical argument is fundamentally that the problems that we face, uh, you, that you face in Holland or the problems that I face in the UK or the problems in South Africa or the Caribbean, those problems may manifest themselves differently, but they are basically the same problem. That is a problem of Western imperialism that is a problem of what has been done to us as black people because of Western imperialism. And the only way to fight against that is to unite as a whole diaspora across and to battle Western imperialism. This is very important. The nation state politics has to go. It can't exist. It can no longer stand. Right? And actually, if you look at someone like Malcolm X, that is really the basis of Malcolm's work. Right? That's really what he's saying. Forget the nation state. When he starts the organization of Afro-American unity, in uh, 64, it could seem at this uh, Malcolm's doing this African American politics, but you know how he actually defined American? For, for Malcolm, American was anybody who was in the West. That included the Caribbean, that included Latin America, that included Europe. And basically said we need to get rid of the nation state. Really, really, really important. Okay. So that's kind of the underlying context of black radicalism in Europe. It must connect to black radicalism elsewhere, right? Now, as I'm saying, I'm writing this book about black radicalism currently, and probably half the book, at least half the book, is basically saying black radicalism isn't these things that we often think it is. And in doing that, I'm basically saying there's two things you have to be to be black, to be black radicalism. One is black, which I'm going to get to afterwards, but importantly, is radical. And actually, a lot of the things we think of radical really, 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 really aren't radical. And I go to, and you're going to hear me quote Malcolm X extensively. As you, I, I love Malcolm X. Malcolm, for me, is the best intellectual thinker on the problem of blackness and the problem of black politics. And not that Malcolm necessarily created all of the ideas, but Malcolm articulates the ideas very, 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 very well. 
All right? And actually, a key underlying principle you'll see, so one of the things that we're doing in Birmingham City University is we've started the first black studies degree in Europe. And the key to starting that degree is to say that actually most of the knowledge that you want to learn did not, does not reside in the, in the academic canon. Most of the knowledge you want to understand blackness and understand radical, understand politics, you need to go elsewhere than the university textbooks to find it. Like you really do, actually. If you want to understand race, you want to understand racism, you want to understand blackness, the worst place you could look is a university library. And this comes from somebody who works at a university, right? So I'm telling you straight up, don't look in the university library. Go to the activists, go to Malcolm, go to Claudia Jones, go to Asata Shakur, go to Otto Hazwood, go to the, those are the people who understand what blackness is, to understand the politics and understand the mobilizations. This is a really important part of what we're trying to do. All right, so anyway, I'm going to ask you another question. It's turning into, turn into a bit of a quiz. But <laughs> what do you think makes something radical? What makes something radical? Okay, so not going as, uh, what do you mean by as planned? Okay, yep, so do, do changing the script and doing something different than what's expected. Yes, definitely. Is that a hand at the back? Okay, so yeah, so a different imagination. Can we do things completely different? Definitely, definitely, definitely. There was an idea. No compromise. Yeah, and these actually these are all really good examples. No one said anything I can really disagree with. Yeah, and yeah, definitely no compromise. Doing some, doing things different, completely differently, changing the script. What currently today, what politics is most associated with the word radical? Radical radicalization. This must happen in Holland as well. When we say radical nowadays, or the media says radical. Radical Islam, right? You actually know that radical Islam can't, couldn't possibly exist. Now, radical Islam is actually impossible. And I'm going to tell you why this is. So if you think about radical, um, how we currently think about it in the mainstream at least, right? Is that radical it is, literally gets conflated with the idea of extremism, right? Radical and extreme. Radical is violent, right? Actually, none of these things are particularly true. In fact, radicalism is the complete opposite of extremism. The total and utter opposite of extremism. And what do I mean by that? Extremism is when you take the basic principles of something and you take them all the way to the all the way to the extreme, right? So Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany doesn't re Nazi Germany doesn't rip up the script of the West in any way. It just takes the script of the West to the extreme. And you have extremism, fascism, right? If you look at um, Islam, if you look at the jih jihadism, it takes the script of Islam to the extreme, right? Radical Islam would stop being Islam because what it means to be radical is it means to throw away the script. It means to look at the underlying principles of something and to reject them and to start again. So in that, you can't have radical Islam. Radical Islam would no longer be Islam, right? They're actually the complete and utter opposite of the thing, right? The point of radicalism is to overturn the existing system and to create a new system. And it's only those arguments that do that which are radical. And in fact, it's the decline, I argue, in radical politics that has led to the uptake of extremism. So why is it that you have all these people, not just in the Middle East, but also in Africa? Actually, um, jihadism in Africa is a huge problem. Kenya, Nigeria, spreading down west and spreading south. Huge problem. And why is it that people are picking this up? Is it because they really believe what's being told to them? No. Actually, there was a French journalist, I can't remember his name, French journalist who was um, kidnapped by ISIS in Syria, Iraq, I think it was Iraq. And he was basically saying that these people didn't really believe most of the stuff in, in, in the Quran. That wasn't why they were there. They were there because they really had nowhere else to be. Right? It was, what else are they going to do? And what's happened is the West has basically decimated large parts of the world. And the only people articulating a response that says this, this needs to change, we need to, we need to overthrow, we need to do something different, is nowadays it's a jihadist, right? Who else is saying? Who else is saying that the West is so evil and needs to go? Nobody else, right? Fifty, not even fifty, thirty years ago, 
you had movements, liber revolutionary movements across the African continent, across Asia, in, in, in America, that said that this needs to change. The un and people understand, this is what you have to understand, that the grassroots, the people who feel this the worst, understand that this system can never deliver for them. They are not stupid. They're not just sitting there like hungry and poor and saying, oh, what do we do next? They understand that this system cannot deliver for them. And when radic real radical politics that says, let's do something differently, let's overthrow this system and put in a, a new liberatory system has gone, they're drawn to the next best thing. And the next best thing is the extremes because there's nobody else making these arguments. So one of the th if you want to get rid of jihadism, which we should because it's a terrible, poisonous doctrine, we need to bring back radical politics. And I guarantee you, all those people who are joining, joining ISIS, they'll be joining the radical movements that want to make things better. Right? This is a big part of this argument. So reinserting radical politics can actually help to get rid of something like that extremist idea. The reason I say all of this is because when we're talking about radicalism, we are not talking about violence. Violence, the idea that violence and radicalism go together is again extraordinarily problematic. The most violent system, political system that's ever existed is the one that we currently all subscribe to. Nothing has killed more people than Western imperialism. Nothing has come close to killing as many people as Western imperialism. Today, three million children will die in sub-Saharan Africa because of Western imperialism. A child dies every 10 seconds. I mean, I've been speaking for what, 10 minutes? That's hundreds of, you could literally, by the time I finish today, you could pile up the dead bodies of children under the age of five who died because of the system which we all live in. There has never been a more violent system, right? People like Malcolm or people like um, Asajj Kaur, the Panthers, are arguing for violence. All they are doing is recognizing that in order to overturn a violent system, you're probably going to need to use violence. Right? The West is hardly going to go, oh yeah, okay, here you go. You can have your revolution. It's not going to happen, right? So violence, isn't part, violence is not part of the ideology of radicalism. It's just that some, it will eventually probably be <laughs> necessary to overturn the system that we have. Right? But because this system is so violent in the first place. Right? So I never conflate violence with radicalism. They're not, they're not the same thing. All right, so thinking about radicalism, why do we need radicalism more generally? So look, I, I believe in revolution. I would say that revolution is absolutely essential if we want to have anything like liberation. Now you may not believe this, and most people probably don't believe this, but even if you don't believe that we need a revolution, without the radical arguments, without the radical movements, you tend to have what we get now, which is stuck. Stuck really going nowhere, because there's nothing to push it, there's nothing to move it, there's nothing to enforce it. Think about why, why do we have the welfare state in Europe? Because they were terrified of communism. They were literally terrified of communism. And because they were terrified of communism, they made concessions and, and created a welfare state. This is why, without communism, there is no welfare state. Believe me, it doesn't happen. Why do you have the limited civil rights gains in America that you have? And I'm calling them gains because they're not really gains, but why do, you, why do you even have those limited gains you have? Because they were terrified of the Black Panthers. They were terrified of Malcolm X. In fact, Malcolm was probably the biggest critic, biggest critic, not even probably, Malcolm was the biggest critic of the civil rights movement calls the um, 1963 March on Washington, calls it the farce on Washington. Says it's a, a picnic, it's a, it's a production that Hollywood couldn't have topped. Hated it, hated every second of it, right? Called um, Martin Luther King an Uncle Tom on more than one occasion. Was the biggest critic of civil rights you could ever have. But what did Malcolm say was his role? He actually meets um, Coretta Scott King uh, in 1965, just before he dies. And he went down to Selma the week before MLK was going to give this big speech and Martin Luther King's really mad, he's kicking fuss going, why did he come, he's taking my spotlight, he's trying to undermine me, blah blah blah. So Malcolm meets with Coretta um, and he says, you know, the reason I came was actually to help Dr. King because if I come down here called talking revolution and talking violence, talking bloodshed, and then when Martin Luther King turns up next week, they're going to be much more likely to listen to what he has to say. Right? And this is how you need radical politics. Without radical politics, this is where we are, stuck. We're not going anywhere in this moment. And you also need radical politics because you need a radical analysis. A radical analysis is also just as important to this, to change the tone and the tenor of the debate. And I'm going to use an example to, um, to, to, to give you an example, which is actually isn't even an example which is pr primarily about race. But I'm sure you've heard in, in London there was a, a major fire, major disaster, Grenfell Tower, where they're admitting that 80 people died. It's probably double that. It could be treble that, and they don't know. But it's going to be a large number of people 
who died in a, in a fire in London. Now, why I, say, excuse me, why I say the radical analysis is important, because what we're hearing now from the politicians, from the media, from the commentariat, is this was a failure of the system, right? So if you look at what happened in the fire, the, the fire happens in social housing, housing is paid for by the state. This is not a coincidence. It was poor people that were in the fire. Um, the fire also happens after a 10 million pound renovation of the block just recently. So this isn't even about neglect. It's not even like this when poor people go away. They actually invested money in the building. Um, hmm? They did. They invested 10 million pounds in the building just recently, reno renovating the building and the building burned. Um, this for me isn't an example of failures of the system. This is the system. I mean, this is the success of, this is the logic of the system at bay. This is what happens when you have the political and economic system that we have. So as I said, this isn't about neglecting the people in the tower. They spent 10 million pounds renovating the building. In this renovation, basically what it seems like caused the fire was when they renovated the building, they put this, um, I don't know if, you do, if they're doing this here as well, but in the UK we have quite a lot of old tower blocks, quite tall buildings, which are quite run down. And they put cladding on the outside of them one for insulation, but also two to make them look nicer, right? And the cladding they put on this particular building and at least 27 other buildings at this point, it could be more, was flammable, flammable, burnt, right? And it seems like it was the, flat, the cladding itself which made the flat fire spread and killed so many people. So they literally spent 10 million pounds putting the cladding on a building which killed people. That's not neglect, that's the system. And you have to ask yourself, why does, why, why does this happen? Right? What may what leads a government to put and even the government what, what leads someone to put flammable cladding on the place where people live? Right? To take it, they also took away a fire a fire escape in this renovation and they didn't put sprinklers in, in the building in this renovation. Right? Ten million pounds turning the place into a tomb, effectively. Right? Now I'm sure they never actually meant to kill anybody in this. I'm sure they never said, Well, let's do this to kill people, this is a great idea. But if I get in a car drunk and kill somebody, I also can't then say, well, I didn't mean to do it, right? I am still culpable for this. This is still led to me doing this. Yeah? And it's and lots and lots and lots of things, but it, it is really, if you look at accountability, so state, I don't, and again, I, I imagine it's probably similar in, in, in Holland, but the state is no longer directly responsible for council housing. There's a private company that organizes it and, and does stuff. Regulations have been cut dramatically in the UK. So in the UK, and this is not a joke, in the UK, anytime they introduce a new regulation on something, they'll take away two other regulations, which may not be related to this area they're regulating, just because they believe there's too many regulations on the book. And it's like a mad, like it's literally madness. We're just going to cut regulations for no reason. So the, so the, this cladding, which is actually banned in America, the land of the free market, is banned there, it's somehow not banned in the UK, right? Because we have a very, 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 very small uh, lack of regulation. Enforcement, there's no one there to enforce because we've had austerity for the last five years, which has cut funding to local councils by about 40%, and in some areas, much, much higher than 40%. So you basically created a system where you're turning buildings into tombs, and you're taking away the regulatory, and you're taking away the um, inspectors, and you're taking away all these things. And you're taking away the accountability of, of the state, because the and it, it, it gets worse than all of it. So this cladding, which has probably killed the, the maid, led, led to the loss of life of so many people, they knew before, there's been campaigns before this happened for years saying you can't use this cladding, it's very, very dangerous. The people in the block had been complaining and had raised questions about fire safety for years and it all been ignored, right? So at some point you have to say this isn't a failure of the system, it's just the system. This is just what happens when you have this political and economic system, right? And when we start to think about things in that way, then it starts to mean we have to look at things much deeper. If the system is actually working rather than the system failing in this example, then that means we have to get rid of the government, right? It means you have to get rid of the political and economic system which created this crisis. You can't just have an inquiry, you can't just um, set the head of the council. It's far deeper than that. And that's why you have to have the radical analysis. Because the radical analysis which will push you to do these things, right? And I'll say to anybody, I'll be on record and say it, when the next election comes in the, in the UK, a vote for the Conservative Party is a vote for fire in the Grenfell. That is what it is. Because if you look at the last 20 years, it is that Conservative logic and ideology and policy which has led to those deaths. You can't have it both ways. You cannot grieve those, those people and then vote for the Conservative. It's impossible. Right? It's impossible. But this is why we need a radical analysis here. 
So whether you agree with that or not, you need that analysis there because that's the analysis which will push them to do things much, much, much more differently. Right? So, so as you can see, the radical analysis then says, and this and this goes, this applies to black radicalism, black radicalism as well. Really understanding that when we see the police more at time and again, I mean in America, I mean people, the police are literally just killing people and getting away with it again and again and again and again. This is not a failure of the system. This is the system at work, right? When you have black, when you have black Pete again and again and again in here, this, this, this is how it is. This is what it is. This is what the system does. That's what it. That's what it is. That's how it works, right? When you look at, I mean, I could. I'm sure it's the same here. I'm sure it's the same across Europe. I can list off all the inequalities that face um, uh, black black people, right? In the UK, it hasn't really got better for the last 50 years. Um, if you look at unemployment, if you look at mental health, if you look at police, if you look at, okay, listen, up, right? And at some point, we have to accept again that this is not the failure of the system. This is just a system at work. Those piles of dead children, which I've been talking about, you could, that's not, that is a system doing exactly what it is meant to do. So as Malcolm says, you cannot expect, this, this system can no more produce freedom, justice, and equality for black people than a chicken can lay a duck egg. It's just not meant to happen. So anytime we're looking for equality here, you've lost your mind. Because it's not possible. It's not possible. It's literally impossible, right? Literally impossible. That's the radical analysis. That's not possible. Everything you see, you should expect. And because you should expect it, we should do something a lot different, right? Okay, so that's fundamental. And so when I say black radicalism, it's, that's what black radicalism is based on, right? Takes this idea, says it's radical. Takes this idea that blackness as well and race and says, look, you cannot solve these problems and therefore we need to do things very, 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 very differently. All right. So it's one of the one of the key te- pre- the key parts of black radicalism is it must be revolutionary. And when you're really honest and look at a lot of the things that we're involved in, they are not revolutionary. They are not close to being revolutionary. And it isn't the sort of thing where you can say it's sort of radical. It either is radical or it isn't radical. And there are very, very, very few radical arguments. Maybe ask me about this later. All right. So oh, how long do I have left? Because I've been ranting. I've been rambling. Yeah. I'm going to keep going. I'll keep going until you stop me. All right, so other part that's really important to ra- black radicalism is it must be black, right? Now, that sounds quite straightforward. It must be black because it must be black. But what does that mean that it must be black? So, okay, one of the things which we, we face all the time, a lot of the time as academics and people in general, is this idea that race is the problem. You must have heard this before. Race is itself the problem. And we need to stop talking about race because race is the problem. Now, I agree, race is the problem. Race as a race really, really, really is the problem. If you look at race, if you look at one of the ways in which um, this is in which the West controls us as black people, is through race. I mean, it is through race. It's this concept of race. The race, the idea there is a hierarchy with white people at the top and black people at the bottom. And that hierarchy then becomes legalized, it becomes real. And actually now it is actually a real hierarchy. Of those dead children, you part them up, most of them are black. And then a lot of them are Asian. And there's no white, there's no white children in that dead children list. Right? So actually, this now become a real thing. So the idea that there is a hierarchy of white at the top and black at the bottom has actually been written into the political economy from the very start of the West. The West begins with the expansion around about 1492 of Europe into the Americas. And they use this concept of race to kill 80% of the natives of the Americas. They use this concept of race to enslave millions upon millions upon millions of African people. Right? We were literally not seen as human beings. Like, literally not seen as human beings. We were beasts, we were cattle, we were... As the Lord Chief Justice Mansfield the, the, in 1783, I think it was, said, you cannot treat black people as anything other than cattle, legally, in the UK. We are just cattle, and exactly the same in, in Holland and across Europe. Right? So, and this is what Cedric Robinson, who wrote the book Black Marxism, he calls the creation of the Negro. So they basically imagined there was this concept of the Negro. There was a category of the Negro. This human, this, this an, ahistorical, um, no civilization, more like animals and people, the Negro. They create this idea in their head that there's a Negro and they treat us like that and then they use us like that in order to enrich themselves. Um, I'm, I'm hurt. There's definitely Rotterdam, you can see in. Um, some of the old, I mean, write down a lot of stuff in newer, so you don't necessarily see it as much. Amsterdam, you can see very, very clearly written onto the building. Even in the buildings, you can see the legacy of slavery, right? Everything the West has, everything we are currently built on, the foundation of that is a transatlantic slave trade. I mean, it really is. The wealth that was generated over three centuries of exploiting us as though we were not people um, is the foundation upon which all this is built, right? 
I mean, in the UK, I don't know if you know this, in the UK, they actually gave uh, reparations after slavery. Any idea who they gave them to? Slave owners. Yeah, the slave owners. And they did it here too. They gave reparations to the slave owners. I mean, that is how lucrative slavery was. That to end it, they had to compensate people. In the UK, it's about the equivalent of, I think, two billion pounds they gave. And there's this uh, website, um, British Legacies of Slave Ownership, where they've tracked where all the money went. And it's really interesting because before this point, there was this idea that, oh, maybe it was a church, maybe it was big business. No, slave ownership went far, much, 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 much further down British society than you would think. People owned, like, a share in a slave. Like, people literally just, ownership was very, was vast. In fact, many people, many of the lower working uh, to middle class people actually went over to the Caribbean and were overseers and then and made loads and loads and loads and loads of money. British, and uh, again, it would be the same in, in Holland, involvement in slavery literally st is the basis of the economy. I mean, est conservative estimates are that around 10 to 20 percent of current GDP you can track directly to slavery. I would argue that basically 100 percent of GDP. You don't have any, you literally don't have anything. It doesn't exist, right? The cotton trade is the trade. Um, that fuels the Industrial Revolution in Britain. And there ain't no cotton growing in Britain, right? All that cotton's over in America, it's over in the Caribbean. And the money generated from that meant that people like uh, James Watt um, in, in Birmingham got their resources, got their wealth, got their fame, all right? So the whole industry, in, so this idea that the Industrial Revolution, the political revolution and the scientific revolution are what caused the West to be so great, absolute nonsense. Genocide, slavery and colonialism is what made the West Absolutely great, right? Absolutely important. So, race is the problem. Don't get me wrong. I mean, just that race is an absolutely terrible idea. That that that, that actually, and this is a really important point. That it it does create us as Negro. If you can be a child um, and can die just because you don't have any food and don't have access to food, you're a Negro. If you can be uh, in America and you can be gone down for no reason by the police and there's no recompense, you are a Negro. If you're in Britain and you're, well, I think we're just, we represent 13% of the prison population and 3% of the actual population, you're a Negro, right? Whether, right? whether you like to admit it or not, that is, that is where you find yourself, right? When you're, if you're an enslaved African who has been taken away from, from, uh, from, your, from your land and, and, and whipped, and you're a Negro. That's happened to you. This has happened. This has happened to us, right? Put us in a particular place in the political economy, right? Really important. So, race is the problem. But blackness is not race. And this is a, if you take anything away from this, take this, this away today. Blackness and race are completely different concepts. In fact, blackness is the rejection of race. When Malcolm calls, and again, Malcolm's it's all Malcolm quotes today. When Malcolm calls into being blackness, what does he say? He says, there's a new type of Negro who calls themselves black and makes no apologies for their black skin. The idea of being black is to say, we are not Negroes. We are not going to accept at the place you have put us in the political economy. We are going to organize and resist and to challenge them. So on the slave ships, it's blackness is where, they, where people come together and say, we're not having this. We're going to mutiny. We're going to jump overboard. That's blackness. It's the opposite of race. So anytime we're talking about blackness and someone wants to come tell you about race, you tell them to walk on. Because these are different concepts. And too much of the time, we are so enthralled with how Europeans write and think that it's like we can't think for ourselves, right? Race is a European construct. Blackness is a construct of being which is our concept of being. And it's our concept of being to get rid of not just the Negro, but actually also the West, right? It is this radical idea that says that we must come together as us and say that this thing, the way the color of our skin, the kink of our hair is important because it rep means that it represents our place in the political economy, but also how do we overturn our place in the political economy? That's what blackness is. It's a revolutionary identity of becoming. And that's really important, all right? So this kind of deals, this is actually the chapter in the book I've just finished writing today. So it's kind of literally under, 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 <laughs> fresh um, in my mind. Um, and I swear most of the book is literally the same. A lot of the so a lot of the criticisms you get when you talk about blackness is one, it's race, you need to move past race, blah blah blah. Um, but two, the idea that somehow when you when you articulate this idea of blackness, you're articulating a, a masculine kind of misogynist kind of violent notion of, of being. 
which again is really, really, really not true. One of the things we need to do is to recover our history, which is the work that Mitchell is doing is really important, right? So, I said, I mentioned Malcolm a lot. I, just, I, I love Malcolm X, so I'm going to mention, you hear me talking, you're going to hear Malcolm a lot, right? But, to mention Malcolm does not mean that there are many, many, many thousands of black women who have just as been involved and just as important in this politics of, of, of black revolution. In fact, I wanted to bring, one of the things we made in, in Birmingham, we've made a, a booklet, uh, Figures of the Black Liberation Struggle. So who are the black radical, key people in black radicalism? And half of them are women. Half of them really, 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 really are women. If my actual... Okay, so Malcolm is my favorite person in history. Second favorite person, <laughs> second, <laughs> second favorite person in history. And it's, 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 it's a close, it's a close second. It's a close second. Second favorite person in history is Nanny of the Maroons. You ever heard of Nanny, Nanny of the Maroons in, in Jamaica? Um, Queen Nanny of the Maroons was stolen from Africa from, uh, from Ghana. She was in the Asante tribe. She was a, a leader of the Asante tribe, and she was taken to Jamaica, and she basically escaped. She escaped from slavery. And in Jamaica, um, anybody who's been to Jamaica, there's, there's lots of, most of it's just hill, mountains. There's a little bit you can kind of live on, but most of it's mountains. And the Maroon community in Jamaica, and Maroons generally refers to communities of freed enslaved. Um, and actually, there was lots and lots of Maroon communities. Brazil had probably the biggest, um, had a huge community that stretched uh, for about 100 miles, actually, um, in Brazil at one point. Um, and Jamaica, so they had the Maroons who lived in the hills, who fought the British for, for, for years. And Nanny was really important because Nanny was a, a leader and a war leader. Again, this idea that women don't, don't fight, don't never, 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 never believe that. Uh, Nanny was some of the, some of the best um, war leaders uh, in the black radical tradition of women. Queen Nanny, uh, Queen, Nanny, Queen Nzinga in um, Angola, uh, Yara Santiwa uh, in Ghana. You can literally, you can just list, you can literally list them. Um, but Nanny, Nanny's important because she, she goes to the Maroons, organizes, not understands the terrain, understands guerrilla warfare. It literally took six Maroons to take out a whole entire battalion of British who were trying to come to capture them because they knew that they knew how, they just had strategically they, they were far and far and far away ahead. While well, Nanny was in charge of the Maroons um, in the east, they never um, made any pact with the British. They freed enslaved Africans, and they, it was this kind of revolutionary force. Now, why Nanny's one of my that's, that's one of the reasons why Nanny's my favorite, one of my favorite people. But actually, if you look at the other Maroons, her brother, Kodjo, and I'm going to go into a bit of detail, but it's quite an important story. Um, her brother, Kudjo, was also taken into slavery, also escaped slavery, and also led uh, the Maroons on the west. East, sorry. He led the eastern Maroons, she led the western Maroons. And you couldn't, it, couldn't, it was night and day. Actually, Kudjo's Maroons made a pact with the British. Actually returned slaves back to the British. Worse than that, in, after Kudjo had died at this point, um, but his, his Maroons... Uh, there was a rebellion in 18... Uh, I'm not a historian, so you could never come to me for years, but let's say it was about 1850. There was a, there was a rebellion by Paul Bo led by Paul Bogle in Jamaica. It was actually Kujo's descended Maroons who captured Paul Bogle and gave him back to the British. I mean, this is this terrible, terrible story, right? Whereas the female leader, Nanny, never at any point sold out, gave up until she died, right? Nanny, I have to say, Nanny is my... It's, it's, it's one A and one B. They say one A and one B in terms of history. But you can literally look through this history of, um, and you can find the Black Panther Party remembered as being this kind of male version of sexuality. But again, 60% of the Black Panther Party in America were female. 60% were female. Elaine Brown led the, the Black Panthers. If you look at the Black Panthers in Britain, they were led and started by black women. I'm sure uh, Black Panther troops in, in Europe are the same, right? So when we look back at this history and tradition of black radicalism, the worst thing we can do is do a disservice to the many thousands of black women who are involved in this struggle. It is not a male struggle. Ah, five minutes, all right. So yeah, 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 yeah. I'm ranting up, ranting up. Anyway, so, and so I guess, so I guess this is what I'm saying. When I say, when I say blackness, then, Blackness is is this connection. This connect, what is it? It doesn't it doesn't describe how you should dress. It doesn't describe how you should act. It does describe how you should think, but only to the point of you should think revolutionarily. Only to the point of we have to make our struggles the struggles of those people at the bottom. And this is really important. Actually, this is yeah. I'm going to skip this bit. I'm going to this bit. This this is really important for our place in Europe today. Because what's changed, and since, well, certainly in the last 50 years, so since Malcolm visited Europe and since um, in the last 50 years, what's changed? 50 years ago, racial inequality in, in Britain, at least, and I'd imagine in, in Europe as well, was so severe that there was never any suggestion that we could be fully part of the society. 
right? I mean, you literally, in Britain, there was, there was no law that stopped somebody discriminating against me because of my race. So people did. They said, you can't have this house, you can't have this job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Same in America, same in, I imagine, the same in most parts of Europe, right? So why was, and so before this even, why was Marcus Garvey able to build a, an organization of 5 million people when we can barely organize, build an organization of 10 people and we've got the internet, right? Why was he able to build this organization? It's because when he went, Garvey went around saying, we need to get out of here, we need to do something, we need to get back to Africa because this place is not for us. People got it. They were like, yeah, okay, we really, this is really, the racism that we're facing is so, uh, so in our face that we understand this place ain't for us. Now, what's changed over the last 50 years is you now have legislation, right? You now have race equality legislation. You now have some kind of progress, right? So, like, take myself. I, I've got a very good job in the, United, in, in the United Kingdom, right? I don't face a lot of the daily racism that I would have faced had I, been, had I grown up even 20 years ago, right? And so you have an emergence of a, of a middle class. And so what has that done? That has led people to believe that maybe we have a stake in this society, that maybe there is some freedom and liberation for us here. Right? We've been deluded, and I will say deluded into believing that this system can provide freedom, justice, and equality. It can never, and we should never forget that. And, one of the, and this is why blackness is so important, and why unifying around this color and this hair and this, this it's the reason it is because it reminds us of where our loyalty should lie. Right? So even though I may be fine, when I could literally pile up dead African children. Literally pile them up. I mean, I might say pile, I mean pile. The power will be big. By the time I've been talking now, the power is big. Right? And those children, and I'm connected to them. This should mean that my politics has to be their politics. This should mean that my politics has to be the politics of the people from Africa who are crossing over the Mediterranean and being left to drown by my government, certainly. Right? That has to be my politics. My politics has to be the politics of... Um, people who uh, die of police violence in Europe, in America, etc., etc. And when you say that our politics has to be the politics of those at the bottom, then it changes the entire way that you look at the world. Do not, and when I say this all the time, like the idea that you should be celebrating black professors or, or, or black people getting into parliament, it's, it's, you know, the, our battle is not within this nation state. These nation states are the problem. Black radicalism calls us to make a politics that ends this system. And this is difficult for us because we have to admit that to some extent now, we're part of it. We weren't part of it 50 years ago, but to some extent of it, we're part of it. We're a discriminated part of it. We may not have exactly the same opportunities, but we now still take many of the benefits from this system. And so what that means is that we need to rethink our position in Europe and make sure that our position isn't to support the system which kills so many of our children on a daily basis. That's the challenge of Black Radicalism. Not in this. about that thing. Um, I think we can take two questions, then we'll have a break, 10 minutes, and come back for the Q&A, then we'll uh, end around nine. There's someone with a mic, Kalina is walking around with a mic and a very beautiful t-shirt on. Question in the front by Wendelin. Hi, thanks very much for a, <laughs> a radical heartbeat. <laughs> I, um, I was just uh, thinking about what I learned about Otto Hauswald, which is that he was a, a revolutionary uh, as a communist, and he was all his life dedicated to the fight for class and race as a duo, so as a combination for, to fight for. And in, this, in that position, he discussed with Marcus Garvey, allegedly, uh, I have not read how they discussed, but I can imagine it, because to my knowledge then, it would have been the not putting together of the class and race that Marcus Garvey would have, um, I guess. I mean, that's actually the question to you that you probably know much more about it. But, but uh, actually to end the question is more about this idea of the revolutionary, because I do believe that Otto Heiswald would also be a revolutionary and a radical in that sense. 
uh, however, probably the sense how may be different. Um, yeah, so actually the next chapter of the book is... <laughs> and that is actually on this question of black, mar black Marxism specifically. And um, Marxism is, is radical, it's just not black. And this, is, and this is quite an important distinction. So, and, and what you found historically is lots of people will join the, the Communist Party and then they leave after about 10 years because they realize that Marxism cannot solve the race problem. It really can't. And part of that is that to really understand class, uh, is to, and when you understand how class is racialized, then actually you understand the privileges of the Western working class. And the Western working class have always had privilege in relation to the Negro. Always. To say that, for sure, because he fought within the uh, Communist Party those kind of racist mm. uh, presumptions. Yeah, so the question is, and I guess, and I guess the question is then, can... And I, I'm going to give you this argument, and I would say, look, I, I don't see how Marxism resol resolves the problem of race, given the arguments of Marxism. I just don't see it, right? Because if you actually think about, and this is, and this is, this, and I, partly this is because Marx, I think, dies before things change. So if you look at the Communist Manifesto, there's about 20 things at the end of it, um, demands they want, and about half of them actually get met. So you get free education, you get um, employment support. There's lots of things, right? And what happened was the system kind of, because we terrified of communism, it gave more advantages and more, more benefits to the working class, right? Now this ties in the working class here into the system in a way that people outside have never been tied into it, right? And the worst exploitation, even before the, the welfare state, was still reserved for people of color. So slavery, they, when they need to find slaves, where do they go? They go to Africa and bring in this dehumanizing and we're not people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's little evidence, little evidence to suggest that the working classes here really want to overturn the system which has benefited them. Maybe it's true, but I have never seen this. Actually, if you look at the trade union movement, if you look at the left now, Fanon talks about, because there's always been this idea you have to, you have, to have the working class and Marx, and, it's, it's a, and even Franz Fanon talks about having to, the working classes of Europe, the, the sleeping beauty that need to wake up. If we're waiting for them to wake up, we'll be waiting forever. And so this is what black, right? It may, maybe, you, maybe the white working class will come on board, but we haven't got time to wait for them. And I think that's a really important part of black radicalism. It centers this idea of race and it says that, of, of blackness, and it says that we have to organize around blackness. And if people want to join, they can join. But we can't be having a politics that relies on them because we will never get anywhere if we do that. Hi, I have a question. Um, what do you think the right way to organize black radi radicalists is? Yeah, what's the best way to organize the black radicalism? Okay, so I said, this is um, a tricky question, right? Because yeah. take, take everything I just said, mm. and it basically makes most things that we do sound meaningless, right? Yeah. So if the problem is revolution, what's the point in protesting black people, for example, right? Yeah. And this is really not what I'm arguing at all. Actually, the best way to organize is on local concerns. If you look at someone like the Black Panther Party, um, or even the, the Garvey movement, or really any movement, any movement, you could go not just uh, black movements, any movement that's successful is a movement that can deliver on the, gra on the very, very, very grassroots level. What makes the Panthers successful first is they actually put a stoplight up on a busy intersection in Oakland. And this makes people come to them and like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to do these things which are people's concerns. You have to. You have to be able to provide some kind of support uh, for the symptoms of racism. Have to do. But at the same time, you, you can't just do that. And this is basically what we've done, definitely in the UK, is we have a lot of work on the symptoms of the problem, but they're never about the actual disease, right? But you have to treat the symptoms. So we have to organize around the symptoms, but we also then have to connect that to the bigger, to the bigger questions. So political education is really, really, really important. This dis ideological discussion is really, really important. But also what we need to do is we have to cr tie the, 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 the grassroots and the local into a big organization. What I would say is that, so when Malcolm X dies, talk about Malcolm again, um, he's made the organization of Afro-American unity, which is kind of based on Garvey's movement. And what it basically is, is if you look at the structure of it, it's lots of local organizations doing local concerns, but they come together into a big movement nationally, they come together in a big movement globally. This is what we need to be building towards, because then you have, you deal with the local, but you tie it into the bigger structure. And, that's a, and, and we have to have that kind of long-term vision. That's not going to happen tomorrow, but if we plan for it, give it 20 years, we can actually have 
um, what we call the, the, the structure of a global black nation, the, stru the, the structures where we can then start to say, actually, let's create something different. But it, it needs to have that long-term vision in it. Thank you. Um, I yeah, I don't mind going on either. People who are up for a break, really need a break. Okay, let's carry on then, just for 50 minutes. Then my, my, okay. my English is not so uh, good as yours. Still, I want to put a question on you. If it's uh, how you see uh, uh, the problem of getting alliance in the black movement. Uh, and then I want to give the example of South Africa. We know the uh, Communist Party uh, joined there with the ANC in the struggle mm -hmm. for uh, changing uh, the system there. Is such a parallel uh, possible in a Western uh, setting, in your view? Um, it's definitely possible. Uh, the question is, is it Preferable, I guess. And I think if you, look, if, you, if you take somewhere like South Africa is an interesting case, right? And actually, if you look at that alliance around, it was very much on the nation state formation. It was very much, you want to have this problem of apartheid, you want to end apartheid, and they mobilized the alliances. But it also tells you the limits of the alliances. Because actually, look at South Africa today. It ain't really that much better than it was in apartheid. If you look at the economic problems, if you look at problems of violence, if you look at, I mean, South Africa in many ways is a failed state and it was a failed revolution. And one of the reasons why it fails in South Africa is far too much compromise. Is these alliances, is this idea we can't do this, we can't do that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so I guess that uh, when you have a politics that's looking for alliances, it's not necessarily doing the things it needs to do. And I think this is what, and in where the place that we are at currently, the black radical struggle does not need alliances, it needs to build itself, because it doesn't really exist. I mean, we say these, these networks of, of, of blackness across, they don't exist. So this for us has to be what we're doing. And then maybe in the future, then you go to alliances. But to have alliances at the start and to have alliances to be the key discussion, and we have this all the time, it's just a wrong discussion to have. And also you often tend to find those alliances are framed around the nation state. And our problems are not, with, our, pro, our problem is the nation state. And so we need to focus more on solidarity within at this point before having alliances as well. But um, anyway, uh, just shortly, I really want to thank you for your, uh, actually for installing, I think, a, uh, yeah, a very important message uh, for us to take home. Uh, what I do feel is, okay, I'm very practical, so if I leave today, mm -hmm. I would want to know what, 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 what would be a first step? What would be something I can even try tomorrow? Would it be, I don't know, investing or, or supporting a local, I'm just stating something, a local store that is owned by someone from the black community. Do you get what I mean? So it's, I mean, it's about interests of black community and we need to be solidar with each other and, and then see if we can build bridges because I believe in that actually. So if not, then I should leave the country, but that would be very, yeah. So, what is? Am I being clear a little bit? I'm trying. Sure. Okay. So, do you have any uh, any thoughts about that? Um, yeah. 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 So, I had this exact same question when I did. Um, so, a lot of this stuff came from my PhD. So, my PhD was on what I was uh, in the UK. We have Saturday schools, supplementary schools, where um, predominantly Caribbean communities have organised schools on the weekend or on in after school because it's the racism is so bad in the schools that the kids don't learn nothing. So we basically organized and taught ourselves. So in my PhD, I was looking at this to say, well, are these spaces of black radicalism? Could you see black radical politics in these spaces? Unfortunately, the answer was no. I wrote a book about it if anybody wants to read it, uh, just to push it a little bit, resisting racism. But anyway, the answer eventually was no. Um, and then so that left me with a, with a dilemma. Look, I believe in black radicalism, but it can't be theoretical, so what do you do? The organizations of black radicalism don't exist. They don't, they don't exist currently. So what we need to go and do is to start those organizations. That is what you should go and do. Actually, from today, you should go and start a black radical organization. That is what you should do. 
<laughs> you know, it was organization. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, thank you. And in terms of a, in terms of a blueprint for this, so this is why, and this is why the, the background of that. Is, so this is why I did. This is what we did in the U, in the UK. We started the Harambe Organization for Black Unity. We based it on Malcolm X's Organization of Afro-American Unity. There's a speech. It's um, the second founding rally of the OAAU. You can find it online. Just Google it. And there is a constitution that Malcolm and other people, and Malcolm, sets out about what you should do. Read that and start that organization. That is what you should do. <laughs> uh, uh, earlier you mentioned you mentioned something about a black college. A black mm -hmm. studies. Black uh, studies. Oh, black studies. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us something more about it a little bit? How did you come about there? Or are, are you one of the persons uh, that, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so Black Studies. So briefly, um, Black Studies is what well, Black Studies is study. It's a, it's an academic discipline that focuses on the contributions, experiences, and perspectives of the African Africa and the African diaspora. Right. One and two uses those to try and um, better the better the, the way that people live. Right. So um, there's a Abdul Al Kalimat in the states calls it the science of liberation. The point of black studies is how do we improve things for black people effectively, right? Simply, anyway. So in America, it exists. It's existed for 50 odd years. And in the UK, we said, look, it's time. We need, we, we can't. I'm a, soci I'm a sociologist, so I study sociology. I write in sociology. And the, the key concepts of race, of nation, they just don't work. They're too Euros. They don't work for us. So one of the first things we want to do with black studies is say, actually, we need a different conceptual framework of language to understand the world, which is centered on, on blackness, right? And some of that exists in the States, uh, and we've used some of that work. So as a research thing, that's what we started to do. So actually, can, can, we, can we think of things differently? Can we have a new language of things? And then that translated eventually into, we managed to hire five, we have five black members of staff in the department, and I'm, I'm pretty sure there's nowhere else in Europe that has five black members of staff in the same department. There's definitely nowhere else in the UK that has five black members in the same staff. And then we've used that to create a degree. So there's now a black studies degree, which will start in September, first, first degree of its kind. And we're using this to say, well, can, you do, can we do academia differently? As you probably guessed from that last speech I just gave, I'm not that convinced of, the, of what the university is. In fact, as a whole speech I could give that would tell you the university is racism. The university produces this concept of race. The, it's from the university, the idea that I'm not a person. So I'm very skeptical to the levels at which you can decolonize the university. So for me, black studies is our attempt to take a space within that institution and to use that differently. So we are teaching radical politics. We are teaching how to engage with the world outside university. We are using university money to support all community organizations. And this is kind of what we're trying to do with black studies. Come, I'll come back in 10 years and tell you it didn't work. But that is the plan, <laughs> that is the plan at this point. So uh, yeah, that was a brief, a brief. Uh, yeah. I also have a question, and it's related to this, um, because there has been a discussion, uh, some of you may be aware of it, some are not, uh, a discussion about the name of this particular institution, with the Wit, um, and it ties into a discussion and campaigns that have been organized both in the Netherlands and abroad. I already showed you that, the decolonizing the university, uh, you also have people involved in campaigns called decolonizing the museum. And yeah, once this project started with Wendelin and Lucy, um, yeah, another discussion started because of the name of this particular institution called Witte de Wit, uh, because it uh, is the name of a person who was involved in this history of, you know, uh, colonialism, imperialism. Uh, Witte de Wit was an admiral of the VOC. Um, and he was also, he also worked for the WEIC, yeah? so the uh, Dutch East India Company and the West India Company involved in yeah, killing a lot of people. So I was wondering what your take is on uh, yeah, this idea or this concept of decolonizing institutions. Can these kinds of white institutions be decolonized or is that also something that's, yeah, that doesn't really uh, <laughs> make a difference? Okay, so I have to be careful what I say on this, on this question. No, on a real level, because I like, I, on the one hand, the answer to that question is simply no. 
This is no, like you can't decolonize the institutions and it makes very little difference whether it's called Witte de Vito or the Marcus Garvey Foundation for this and that, right? In, on, on one level, that's true. But again, as I said before, you have to have a politics that, that starts with local concerns. And even though those local concerns may not be radical, and even though those local concerns may have not fit into the revolutionary picture, you have to start with local concerns. You have to start with where people are, and you have to mobilize from that position, right? And it's just then, it, what's important then is to tie those into bigger discussions. So I think a Rose Must Fall is a good example of that at Oxford. So Rose Must Fall is about the Cecil Rhodes, who's one of the, uh, terrible, terrible, terrible colonialists, has a statue at Oxford. Actually, the movement started in South Africa because they have a statue of Cecil Rhodes in a South African university, which is literally, is my, I mean, yeah, there. Anyway, but so, so, um, but it's not, but it was, uh, Rhodes Must Fall was never just about trying to get rid of a statue. It was the statue as a symbol of other things and then tied into a much bigger discussion, right? And I think that's the key. It's, you have to pick where people are. You have to find campaigns that are going to mobilize people, but then it's tying those campaigns into a revolutionary politics. It's possible to do it. Unfortunately, a lot of the times that doesn't happen, and that's problematic. But you can definitely be, it can definitely be known. Um, uh, thank you very much for your um, very smart uh, uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question is actually about, like, I would like to know how you see the, um, you know, what uh, what is called as refugee movements uh, uh, around Europe, uh, because uh, to me they totally fit uh, your definition of uh, black radical mm -hmm. um, uh, protest or resistance. Uh, it fits the blackness as you define it, and also um, the, the radical part. Uh, like you said, um, you, you started with this uh, concept that, you know, these nation states, these borders, they have to go. And actually, to me, the, um, um, you know, the, the group of people who are actually addressing that on, and are articulating it are actually the refugees. Mm -hmm. And um, also, like, uh, how you see it, I mean, because it's a very problematic thing because they are basically not citizens. In Europe, and it's, uh, so it's very easy uh, for the government to to repress them. So, um, yeah. Um, yeah. So, I, so actually, the next but one chapter of the book. So yeah, let's get read the book. So <laughs> <laughs> I promoted this book really, really well. The book's called Black Radicalism. It'll be out uh, next year. Anyway, but the next one. Actually, I'm starting with a story of um, of this issue because on the one hand, potentially. On the other hand, again, potentially not. So Angela Davis. Um, you want to know Angela, Angela Davis, former Black, Pan, uh, former Black Panther, and she gave this speech where she said that the problem of the 21st century is the issue of um, refugee rights, right? Um, but again, it, it, look at the limits of that, of that framework, right? We cannot just be fighting for refugee rights in nation states in the West. That is not a radical movement. That's not a radical movement, right? If, for me, actually, and this is, this is, this is going to sound bad when I say it, but follow me through. There is actually, my, migration, is, migration is a problem. The levels of migration we have are a problem. Not a problem because of the pressures they're putting on the West, but a problem because the fact that people need to move in the first place. Why are so many people trying to get into Europe? It's not because Europe's wonderful, it's because Europe and the West has run down their country so much that they're either war or economically incapable of, 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 of people, right? There should not be a situation where there are so many people having to jump into boats and risk their lives and lives of their children um, on the sea, because life is that, literally their countries at home cannot support them, right? That is the problem, not refugee rights here. The problem is why on earth are people's countries so bad they want to leave that badly, right? If, we're, if we treat the refugee crisis in that way, that's a radical analysis, right? It can't just be the people who are lucky enough to, to have survived that trip, how do we get them into the Western nation state? No, 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 it has to be, let's stop this from <laughs> needing to happen in the first place. Because if you gave most people the choice, do you want to stay in your nice country where it's warm and you know the weather's all right and you can, have, you, can, you can stay with your family? Or do you want to have to do this crazy trek to come and live at the bottom of these horrible countries here? What, would, what choice would you have? So I think we need to reframe that whole discussion. And when actually to reframe that discussion, then the only real answer to that is revolution in those, in those, in those places. And when that happens, then you'll end the, re you'll end the refugee crisis, right? Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? Um, yes, yes. Uh, um, but I was also wondering, like, um, 
Because, I mean, you know, this, um, this whole refugee movement, this re refugee strike uh, or resistance or whatever you call it, uh, it's a very broad thing. And yeah. there are so many different people in Germany, yeah. so many different groups. Yeah. And uh, there are, you have people who are just, for example, in Germany, they, are, they have very particular demands about the, uh, you know, the way Germany, um, basically the asylum rights, yeah. you know. Uh, but uh, you have more radical groups that uh, ask more basic questions. Uh, about borders mm -hmm. uh, and about this whole idea of nation states, yeah. and uh, it's basically among them. I mean, I, I don't see that anywhere else. Yeah. You know, that that's why I'm actually the, okay. you know, I'm, why I'm asking the question. You know, it's it's not really about refugee rights, mm -hmm. but about um, um, you know the activism, the radical activism uh, that comes from this refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I definitely. I mean, yeah, I mean, I definitely, yeah. definitely, one hundred percent. We have to have this. We have to stop focusing on the nation state. And any argument that brings us away from the nation state is, is usually a good argument. But it can't, again, that just can't be open borders traveling. That has to be tied into this idea of colonialism and coloniality. And yeah. how do we overcome that? And I'm sure that's there. Because again, the people who get this are usually the people who feel it the most. All right. So it wouldn't be surprising that refugees are making these arguments because uh, they're the people who uh, who feel that most keenly. So definitely. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. At least for me, it makes me rethink the system we live in in some certain aspects. But I was wondering if this Western system uh, doesn't work, mm -hmm. and then Marxism also doesn't work. Which type of system <laughs> then <laughs> works? Because I heard about how you, you know, how you can organize mm -hmm. us. I mean, yeah. that's the first good step. But are there any systems? let's say, at least written down, or ideologies, which you think is kind of a little bit closer to, to a system that what would be functional? So actually, so when I say Marxism doesn't work, actually, it's almost, no, I'm not, I wouldn't say you throw out all of Marxism, actually. I think the idea of moving away from private property, the idea of um, shared resources, these things are all good ideas. So there's, maybe we're on the way. Um, in the previous book, one chapter of the book, I actually looked at, <laughs> I actually looked at um, the issue of Pan-Africanism. Because actually, I always thought that Pan-Africanism kind of offered this kind of blueprint for an alternative system. And when I actually looked into it more deeply, complete, I was completely wrong. Actually, totally wrong. I was surprised I was wrong. So I think part of the recognition of, of, of this politics has to be that we need to kind of write this, what that means. I don't think that it exists. There is no clear blueprint for what that looks like. And it, that needs to be one of the things that we do. But to say there's no clear blueprint is also fine, because they don't necessarily have to have a clear blueprint. And to say that's the work, ideological, political work that we need to do. We have some of the key foundations of that in the terms of the black radical tradition will say, one, there's a particular analysis of what the problems are. Two, um, you organize a black diaspora. Three, you go beyond the nation state and effectively create. If you look at organizationally, you have the idea of um, the OAAU to have a, the global black nation. And I go into lots of detail about that. But what that society looks like afterwards is not written. But that just means that's the work that we have to do. But that's the work we have to do collectively as well, I think. So. Um, I kind of wanted to respond to that quite immediately with the thought based upon things that I've had the honour to learn that the written down thing is a bit of a problem. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it's sort of which is why I think it's significant that you're referring to like a black radical tradition and to practices, you know, <coughs> rather than to look for some kind of a text that offers a blueprint, but to find um, traditions and practices. Um, because just as a colleague here has brought forward the um, testimonies and forms of organizing that are emerging among stateless people in um, Europe as refugees at present, um, I also wanted to bring forward the practices and survivance of um, indigenous people within settler colonies as well, who are effectively stateless within states um, and who offer in, in, in uh, uh, yeah, through, through many means, including artistic practice, but also yeah, life patterns, um, uh, serious forms of, of survivance that also acknowledge planetary uh, problems. Yeah, anyway, sorry. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> Um, you said uh, you 
you don't believe in Pan-Africanism, um, so I want to know why, because uh, I think socialism works very great in, uh, in certain uh, countries, so I want to know why. Uh, which countries? Uh, like Soviet Union, China, I think it's very, it, it works very, very great. And so I think like um, the Pan-Africanism Pan movement uh, could also be great. So that's why I want to know why you think it's uh, not a good solution. Um, so I, you know, the problem with Pan-Africanism for me isn't the rhetoric. So you read a lot about the rhetoric of Pan-Africanism. It's great, right? Talk, kind of talks about this idea of the African nationalism and African socialism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, if you look at the reality of the Pan-African movement, um, it hasn't really brought about that at all. Actually, the reality of the, the, the legacy of the Pan-African movement has been the African Union, um, has been NEPAD, the what's NEPAD stand for? The um, New uh, Economic, uh, this crazy neo-imperialist agenda which the AU has been pushing, actually. And I think one of the reasons I want to push this on Pan-Africanism is Pan-Africanism doesn't have a solid ideology. It really doesn't. There's, different, there's lots of different ways you can be Pan-African. And there is this kind of more radical leftist way. And there's also this kind of way that just says, ah, oh, we have this kind of collection of places that fits itself into the Western system. And actually, that's the Pan-Africanism which is one. So you look at people in the AU, they'll tell you they're Pan-African. Look at what they're doing. They're selling that to, to the West in a way and, and selling that to China as well, just to bring in China here. I mean, we say communism works in China. About a billion, about um, 100, 300 million people in China live in absolute destitute poverty. I mean, it doesn't work for everybody in China, right? And so, I guess that would be a problem with Pan Africanism. Not, if you look in the Pan African movement, there's lots of key parts and players who, would, who look quite good. Actually, you look at the legacy of, of, this, of the idea of Pan Africanism, and it's been, taken a, it's been taken down a path it shouldn't have gone there, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think it makes sense, but um, if you look like uh, the people that came with the plan, or maybe the, the most important thinkers, like if you th think about Nkrumah and think also of Malcolm X, um, then it's not the, the watered-down version that we now have now. So, mm -hmm. so uh, I'm more like, is, it, is the, the thoughts that, uh, that Nkrumah had and people like that in, the, in that time, mm -hmm. actually the most important thinkers of that time, um, I don't see why you uh, make it even with the thinkers that are now. So because the ideas. Yeah, no, I guess I guess for me that you have to political ideas as always. What how they end up being expressed, and actually, and I'm not saying I'm against Pan Africanism. I just think Pan Africanism as a is far too vague. It's far too open. It's been far too misused, and I think we need to be much more. I think ideology is really important. Nailing down what we mean ideologically is really, really important. And Pan-Africanism doesn't allow us to do that. And if you actually look at formal, organized Pan-Africanism, that isn't Garveyism, it definitely isn't Malcolm X, it is Du Bois, it's the Pan-African Conference. And actually, Pan-Africanism is about Europe, starts in Europe, in London in 1900, the fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945 in Manchester. If you, uh, France had a Pan-African Congress in the 20s. If you look at the Pan-Africanism which was being argued there, that was not revolutionary Pan-Africanism. There was nothing revolutionary about it. It was only after 45 was the first time anybody said we want independence. Before then, they weren't even arguing for independence. They were arguing for trusteeship within the colonies. And after that, they were, it's the legacy of that form of organized Pan-Africanism that gets you the, the organization of African unity, that gets you the AU, that gets you this kind of amorphous, we have a link of Africa, but we don't go beyond the nation state, right? This is what I'm trying to say. I'm not anti-Pan-Africanism. I'm anti the results of those formal Pan-Africanisms. That makes sense. I just want to add something to that. I think we have, uh, before you start with your question, I think we have about time for two questions left. And then uh, you I'm want just to wrap it up. I just want to add something to that because um, I'm, I'm Cape Verdean, and I don't know if you heard about Cape Verde. And, um, uh, Amilka Cabral, who ha helped uh, us uh, gain our independence, he was a Pan-African. Pan but what I see in um, all these key people, they got killed and their their movement got um, watered down, or how do you say it, whitewashed. So that's what I want to add to the sir in the back too. That yeah, it it, it was a good a good concept at first, but it whitewashed. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
Um, what seems to be obvious from the discussions is that words are extremely important. Mm -hmm. And um, you focused on the word uh, black, and instead of black, you held a plea for blackness, and you explained radicalism is not the same as extremism. Now, my point is that um, there are two, two parties always. One is the speaker and one is the listener. One is the writer and one is the reader. <laughs> So, for instance, a freedom fighter might be called by another one as a terrorist. So, my question has to do is the expression of black radicalism. Shouldn't it be like something black movement? Because the reader will always associate radicalism with extremism. So, the, the, the argument, your arguments are right, but you have to convince other people who are listening or are reading your your book, in fact. Hmm? All right, I do, what's the best way to answer this? So, <laughs> on some level, I don't know how much that is true, so I don't know how much, it depends, it depends what's the audience as well. So, okay, yeah, I don't know the best way to answer this. Two ways to answer this. So one, what's, who's the audience? And actually, with a particular audience, if I say black radicalism, does it have those resonances that you're saying? I don't know. Maybe it doesn't. I won't say it doesn't because it, it might do as well. And I think the other thing is with you have to at some point, and this is the kind of the the basis of ra any radicalism is no compromise. And you have to put out a platform and you have to say this is what it is and you have to reclaim what we mean. So the first time even the word black was used, the first time black was used, black people themselves were scared, terrified of black. I remember I did interviews with people in the 60s and... They were saying, all the activists were saying, when we started just saying black, they were like scared, they didn't want to know, they were like, oh, this blackness is... But you push at it and you make the arguments for it and you move it and all of a sudden, everybody's talking about blackness. Even in the UK, like, you're right. When I first said black radicalism, everybody's like, oh. But I talk about it all the time and now people go, oh yeah, that makes sense, right? And so I think on some level you have to say, look, this is what we're talking about and this is how we articulate it. And it's going to put some people up, that's fine, but it's going to resonate with others. And, and, and the, the, point of of the point of the politics isn't to convince everybody. The point of the politics is to do the work. And then when you do the work, believe me, people will join you whether they agree with the term you've used or not. I guess. So. Yeah, I have one question concerning um, like the concepts you also talked about before. Um, like one example was that when you looked at the communist movement, like that half of the demands of the Communist Manifesto as Marx mm -hmm. put out that they were met. Mm -hmm. And that's something you see also like in the black movement and other movements mm -hmm. that um, basically at some point capitalism or the system or however you wish to define it comes to a point where they do compromise on certain terms. So for instance now, as opposed to 50 years ago, you see um, black university professors or people mm -hmm. in other higher position. Um, yeah, for me, the question is about, you know, on one hand, you can look at it like, okay, we have reached something or because from a perspective of someone who lived 50 years ago, seeing a black university professor, that is uh, in some way a revolutionary thing uh, in terms of, um, yeah, because you're coming from a system which basically says you're less than human or partially human and now you are able to at least like put or be in a certain position which before was impossible but at the same time um, like as you stated the um, yeah people also become a part of that system which still uh, keeps inequality in place still keeps oppression in place mm -hmm. so I was wondering what in your opinion is the kind of strategy to um, yeah, let's say, to prevent being uh, accepting or, um, yeah, to prevent the acceptance of kind of watered down yeah. compromises and still keep that radical perspective, to, like still demand this fundamental change. Like how would you do, like, what would your suggestion be how a movement should approach that? I mean, I think that's why it's important to, uh, the politics has to be for those people who are at the bottom of the system. Because if you look at me, you're going to go, yeah, it's fine, look, yeah, whatever. But no, I am the exception. I am not the rule of the system. But actually, if we're making it, if we're with the grassroots, if we're even in 
you can make this argument that dead. I, that's why I always talk about dead children. So actually, dead children just makes the point, right? And this is a very, very clear, very, very image of all these dead children piled up here that we should remind you all the time of what the system is like. But you can do that on a national level as well. So most people my age who are from my community, went to my school, are nowhere near the situation I have. Unemployment for black men in Birmingham is 50%. 50% unemployment. You can start with that. So as lo we all, and, this is, and this is one of the things that the ac academia has done terribly. And one of the things I have to say, I have to admonish my colleagues about, is we're now complaining about the oppression that, the oppression that we get in universities. I don't hear this thing called microaggression. Uh, microaggressions are these kind of the minor daily slights you get when you're in a position like I am. They are a privilege. The fact that those are the way that I experience race, I should be celebrating because I'm not getting pulled over by the police. I have a very good job. I'm not unemployed. I'm not, ever, I'm not dead. You know what I'm trying to say? But actually, we're now starting to articulate about micro. Like, we're complaining about the little things. This is highly the wrong way to go about it. We should have to orient our politics to those at, at the bottom. And that's why blackness is important because it makes us do that. And when you do that, you can't lose sight of the bigger picture, I think. Yeah, we only need two more votes indeed. <laughs> um, I think that was a great end of the Q&A. Uh, thanks again, Dr. Kende Andrews, all the way from the UK Birmingham City University. Um, the new course, the Black Studies course, will start in September 2017. If you're interested to learn more, read more about radical blackness, you can sign up and enroll maybe for next year. Um, this was also the last event of our program, at least, at, uh, for the Black Archives in, on Tour in, here in Rotterdam as part of the Cinema Holanda platform. Next week, Quincy Gallio will have his program, so check out the website. Uh, there will be a few uh, you know, other great events, also by Charles Landvreugd and a few other people. Uh, the ASCA uh, will show a few films. Uh, too much to mention, just check out the website, it will be great. Um, tomorrow we will have another session with Dr. Andrews, but then in Amsterdam at our actual archive, in the Black Archives, uh, at Vereniging on Suriname. You can still sign up, uh, it will be from 3 to 5 p.m. So we can still get some sleep and uh, do something in the evening. And it will be about the Black Studies movement in the UK. So uh, before I end, I heard that we only need two more votes. So who didn't vote yet? Everybody voted, I don't believe you. OK, two people, OK. Those two people are going to complete uh, the, the campaign for today. But then the, for the real work will start. On July 1st, we will launch our campaign uh, at the Kitty Koti Festival in Amsterdam, also Park. And everybody who wants to join, everybody who wants to contribute, of course, by making a donation, but also in another way, if you want to help spread the word uh, in, in, in uh, you know, whatever way possible, contact me or contact NUC. Um, and then I think we can all contribute to uncovering um, and de-erase all of these hidden histories, all of these hidden stories. So I would like to thank Witte de Wit, despite the awful name, <laughs> it has been, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> despite the awful name, it has been a great, um, it has been a great uh, collaboration, especially with uh, Natasha, she's, uh, uh, what, eight months pregnant and still working. Um, yeah. The technicians, Paul, everybody, thank you for the collaboration. Same goes for Wendelin. Um, so if you're not signed up yet, go to the website, theblackarchives.nl, sign up for the newsletter, and then you can stay in touch. We will be here for 30 more minutes to uh, you know, have some drinks and talk. If you didn't check it out yet, check out the exhibition. And hopefully, we will see you soon. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>